we are beginning the next program, and this lecture is called Romanticism or Native Grounds, and it occurs roughly between the time periods of 1800 and 1840. During this time period, the new nation begins to grow. We have our first president, George Washington, in 1789, and we also see the country beginning to grow and prosper a lot more than it did before. We were a pretty wealthy nation, which is one of the reasons why England wasn't all that willing to give us up, and now we are continuing to prosper and grow and expand, as we did with the Louisiana Purchase in 1803. We also find ourselves moving towards a more industrial society, and we even had some industrial spies over in Europe trying to get some great ideas about how to run our factories. Along with our growth and our expansion and our prosperity, we begin to really recognize our national pride and our identity. Even though we had a lot of pride and a lot of prosperity, we also had some struggles. One of our biggest struggles had to do with finding a way to join together our very different areas of the country, our vast regional differences. And we have, you know, you can see here the definition of Massachusetts as opposed to Georgia. And how do we marry those two vastly different cultures together, especially when we didn't have means of communication like we do today, like telephones and, and internet and even good roads and safe ways to travel. Um, and with that, it led us to really the challenge of how do we join together and act as a single nation. And as we find out not too long after the end of this time period, we struggle with that when we enter into a civil war. Romanticism itself, this time period that we are defining, was at first a reaction to the age of reason that came before. You will find that many of these time periods have some kind of a boomerang, some kind of a reaction back to the time period that came right before it. And this is sort of a, an anti-reaction to the age of reason where we wanted to go kind of the other way. We found that not only did that occur in Europe, but it also occurred in the United States. So there was a romanticism movement in Europe as well as in the United States. In America, we found that now that we had a new nation and a new government and a new system, we needed to have a literature that really defined that. A gentleman named Royal Tyler wrote, we need to write our own books and that they exhibit our own manners. Um, up until this time, however, we really didn't have literature. We had novels. Uh, there was a gentleman, or, excuse me, a woman by the name of Susanna Rousen who wrote a novel called Charlotte Temple, which was published in 1794, and it was really pretty much a morality novel, uh, so to speak, how not to behave. And it was almost like a cautionary tale for young women who wanted to move off and leave the farm and leave their home and go off into the city. And all kinds of horrible things happened to Charlotte Temple because she didn't follow the right conventions. We also have Charles Brockton's Violin, and um, neither one of these, along with the many others that were written during this time period, were considered literature. They really kind of fell more into the category of sentimental writing. What we do find with writing during this time period, though, is that authors are starting to write about more American topics, more American subjects. We still don't have a, a national style, but we do have some national topics. We have the wilderness. We have, of course, freedom. We just want a revolution. We are the most, what we consider anyway, to be the most powerful country in the world. We just basically defeated the most powerful country in the world, and we're pretty cocky about it, and so we want to write about it. We also have the pioneers moving westward, and we have this unique sort of American town and city life that is different from really anything that came before it in Europe. And we're pretty proud of that and we want to write about that. Definitely we are writing about westward expansion, the Lewis and Clark expedition, and one of our favorite American topics, individualism. When we do start to talk about the development of actual American literature as opposed to the sentimental uh, literature that we discussed earlier, the sentimental writing, we find that during this time period, very much unlike the revolutionary time period, the nationalism, we have people who are writing 
to make a living at it. Um, unfortunately, they're still not able to completely make a living at it. Many of them struggle to support themselves or had different jobs. For instance, Nathaniel Hawthorne had to be uh, had to work in a government job that his friend, the president, got him just simply because he couldn't make enough money uh, writing. We did find that the literature was different uh, in that it used American places, American people, American experiences, and we start to as it. I said earlier, grow our national consciousness in literature. During this time period, however, we still find that our style, our writing style, contain British and European forms. We don't have any purely American voices yet. That's going to take a little while longer to develop, but we are sort of in our developmental stage, sort of like you're a teenager, you, you want you desire your independence and you're able to achieve your independence in many ways, but you still are kind of stuck having to rely on your parents, having to rely on other people to kind of get you through things. And that's really where we are as a country and our literary voice right now. We're still sort of relying on what has come in the past. These six traits of romanticism are going to be incredibly important for you to write down and take note of. We find that with most romanticism, most romantic literature, and when I say romantic, I don't mean like mushy gushy love stuff. I mean romanticism as in love of nature. And we're going to find that many of these traits are not going to be found in every single piece written by every single author. Certain authors are going to specialize in certain traits. So we have love of nature. We have the focus on the self, the focus on an individual. We often find in Romanticism a fascination with the supernatural. In a few minutes, we're going to look at some authors and talk about how they perhaps choose one of these traits of Romanticism and use those traits more than others. There is a yearning, what we call for the picturesque or the exotic. And what that really translates into is a focus kind of on the past and the small town life, perhaps maybe quaint, quirky environments that define us as a nation. There's a sense of idealism, a sense of uh, the need for perfection. I mean, after all, we just achieved really what the world considered to be an impossible feat. We defeated the, the biggest power in the world. So we're sort of cocky and proud of ourselves and definitely idealistic about what, what our abilities are. What we have to realize about that element, that specific trait in romanticism, is that when you're idealistic, when you shoot for the moon and kind of expect the the unattainable, oftentimes you have a farther way to fall. And so definitely we're going to see the two sides, the real highs and the real lows in Romanticism. And finally, we have oftentimes what we see in American literature during this time is a passionate nationalism, a love of country. And of course, why shouldn't we love our country? we've just done amazing things and we're very proud of ourselves and we have reason to be. So we wonder now at this point, as I'm talking about the difference between literature and writing and authors who couldn't make a living, who did write the good stuff? Who wrote the stuff that's worth reading that starts to develop an American style? Who wrote those things? Well, we're going to start talking about Washington Irving, and Irving focused often on that picturesque or the past trait of Romanticism, and he used very uniquely American settings. He used American folk characters. He started to develop kind of the folk hero in America. He used American situations, American rumors and legends, and that further promoted the importance of establishing that uniquely American literary art form, and thus national unity and pride in, in country. His well-known works are The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, which you probably remember with Ichabod Crane and the Headless Horseman. Also Rip Van Winkle, The Man Who Fell Asleep for 40 Years, which is actually a, a political tale. There are many more, but these are just a few that you might have heard from.
excuse me, heard of. James Fenimore Cooper is another gentleman who wrote during this time period. He also focused on American heroes uh, of the frontier, such as a gentleman by the name of Natty Bumpo, whose legendary past, he was kind of a hero who lived during the time of the Native American struggles and kind of uh, straddled both worlds in that respect. And uh, Natty Bumpo was a character that we found oftentimes in uh, a well-known work called The Last of the Mohicans. You might have seen the major motion picture entitled The Last of Mo the Mohicans. William Cullen Bryant was one of the many poets during this time period, um, and he focused on the love of nature, poetry mostly with that deep feeling for nature, and the focus that there is, uh, if you connect to the natural world, natural world it provides you with an insight into humanity and, and we get a better peek at ourselves by connecting with nature. There will be more of that in our next unit, um, the flowering of New England, but this is just sort of the beginning of that. Oh, and here's a man you've heard of, I'm sure many, many times, Edgar Allan Poe. And Poe wrote a lot of literature. He was a very prolific writer, even though he was never able to make a living as a writer. He wrote poems, he wrote short stories, he wrote literary criticism. He's probably, during his time, was best known for his literary criticism. Poe focused on that emotional element and the focus on the supernatural kind of elements of romanticism. He focused on the tortured minds of characters and characters who faced inner turmoil, turmoil sort of that idealism versus reality um, struggle. He also focused on the dark, irrational side of the imagination. And you, I could list many, many works by Edgar Allan Poe, but I would say one that you may have definitely heard of is the short story entitled The Telltale Heart and uh, the poem called The Raven. Nathaniel Hawthorne is another author during this time period. He wrote short, short stories and novels mostly. He is considered both a romanticist and a transcendentalist, which is the concurrent philo philosophy that we're going to be covering in the next le lecture. He focused mostly on the past, um, oftentimes that picturesque, exotic element, which he defined often as the Puritan ancestors. There were some deep emotional struggles in his perspective about the struggles of sin and guilt. And if you remember anything about the Puritan elements, you know that they really struggled with, am I the chosen one? Am I a good person? Am I, am I bound for heaven? If I'm, am I bound for hell? Is what I'm doing an outward representation of an inner um, guilt that I might have? And along with that, Hawthorne liked to incorporate elements of the supernatural in his work. His well-known work was The Scarlet Letter, but he wrote many, many more stories and novels. The last slide we're going to do today, the last part of our lecture, are the philosophies of Romanticism. So let's make sure that we focus on these philosophies. These are quite important for us to, to write down. Um, let's go back one there. First of all, Romanticists relied on their emotions and on intuition, which is very different than what the Puritans relied on. The Puritans relied on God and devotional literature in the Bible. Romanticists reacted by going the opposite way and relying on their emotions and their intuition, which is really how do they feel about something? What's their hunch? What's their gut feeling? They also had an attitude of excess, whereas the Puritans limited themselves and abstained from many activities, romanticists like to explore kind of going over the top and, and what would happen when you did that. Another romanticist philosophy has to do with, again, we talked about finding evidence of their beliefs in nature and the supernatural, and we see that quite often in Edgar Allan Poe and Nathaniel Hawthorne's pieces. Their central self force, excuse me, was the self, which again was very different than the Puritans whose central force was God. Romanticists turned that completely inward and said the most important force in my world is me. And you can see where uh, that would cause some inner turmoil and some stories where people are really focusing on their own experiences and how they're struggling. They were concerned with idealism and perfection. And as I said before, what happens when we're not able to achieve that perfection, when idealism meets reality, and how far do we fall in that respect?
as we talked about with the traits of romanticism, they glorified the past. They glorified the exotic and the picturesque. And when we say glorified, we don't necessarily mean they made it look good. They thought it was awesome. Glorified simply means to shine a light on something. And oftentimes Nathaniel Hawthorne would do that. He would shine a light on, or even Washington Irving would say, this is how it was in the past. Let's examine it and focus on what worked and what didn't work. So they looked at the past almost in a reflective way. And lastly, as we've talked about before with the six traits, they believed they were citizens of a great country and possessed a strong national pride. Again, I will end this lecture with reminding you that we just defeated the biggest superpower in the world and we felt pretty good about ourselves and we felt pretty good about where we were going as a country. And Romanticism literature will reflect the high highs and the low lows of all of those American experiences.